Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Pruitt again. We are going to talk about pain management today. A very important topic for a large percentage of our patient population. Pain management is a little bit difficult, and hands down, with the release of the new guidelines last year, this is one of the things that I get the most frequent questions about from providers, is which one do I choose, how do I choose it, what's our dose again, and how do they work? So I'm really excited to talk to you about this today and go through uh, our whole buffet of options that we have. I realize that in the last year, we've almost um, doubled our pain management options, and we've also transitioned from morphine to fentanyl, which is a whole lot of changes um, and very important to understand when to use which drugs and what they do and what their side effects are. So when we're considering which pain medication to give, there's a lot of factors to juggle when you're making this decision. One will be thinking about how quickly is this drug going to act, how quickly do I need to act, how severe is this pain, and then how long is this medication going to be taking effect for the patient, what am I aiming to do here, what do I think is the root cause of the pain, how chronic is this pain, and then what side effects do I need to think about when I'm taking the whole consideration of the patient. One of the tools that I'm sure everybody's familiar with is the analog pain scale, uh, 0 to 10, tell me how bad your pain is, 0 is no pain, 10 is the worst pain you can imagine. I'm sure we have all had the patient who's sitting there texting with totally normal vital signs and no obvious signs of injury who says that their pain is a 12 out of 10, which makes it a little bit difficult for us when we have to chart that their pain is a 12 out of 10 and they clearly are not appearing to be in any pain. So this is where the art of pain management comes in. We do um, practice clinically, and we all have clinical assessment skills. So one of the things I like to do when I am assessing pain, and it's not inherently obvious, is looking at things like facial expression, the way the patient is moving their body or choosing not to move their body, how tense are their muscles around the area where they're hurting, and I think one of the easiest ways to clinically judge pain would be looking at vital signs. So aside from just being human and being able to look at somebody and be like, oh my goodness, that person is really hurting, you can use their vital signs also to indicate um, how severe you think their pain is. Tachycardia and hypertension along with tachypnea are three very common um, vital signs that get elevated when someone is hurting. Now, if you have a patient who is in obvious pain, maybe with an obvious fracture or some other terrible traumatic injury, and you want something that's going to act fast so you can move them and get them going to the hospital, my uh, two favorite options are intranasal and IV. Now, I think intranasal is a fantastic option that we don't use enough in the field. It um, doesn't take time to set up an IV and get a line going in a vein. You can just give it immediately, and it's going to act very fast. The cool thing about intranasal is if you look at this picture here, the medication goes right up through the nose, and there's a very thin bone there called the cribiform plate, and that's the only thing separating the patient's brain from the outside environment. So essentially, when you're giving that medication, you're sending it directly to the receptors where it needs to hit to control their pain. And our intranasal options that we have for pain control in the field right now are, uh, is just fentanyl. We can also give Versed intranasally, um, but that's not necessarily for pain control. IV is also a fast onset of action. If you do have time to get that line going and choose to go that route, it's fine to do that as well, realizing that that um, medication is going to take effect a lot faster when it's injected directly into the bloodstream. We can also give Tordal IV as well. Now, IM and PO, um, if we're giving intramuscular shots or giving oral pills, this is a option for patients that have minor to moderate pain where you don't need to immediately control their pain and you have a little bit longer to wait. Um, the benefit to that would be that the pain medicine is going to last a little bit longer, so you get a longer effect for what you're giving them. Now, the big question in everybody's mind is usually, well, how do these drugs work? And there's several different places in our body where we have pain receptors. One, obviously, being the brain. 
two being the spinal cord and three being the tissues where the traumatic injury has actually occurred. And each of our pain options act in different locations. So narcotics are going to be acting directly on the receptors in the brain that are telling your brain that your body is hurting, whereas NSAIDs are going to act at directly at the injury site to stop the inflammatory cascade. And when I say NSAIDs, I'm talking about ibuprofen, Tylenol, and Tordol, which are our pain control options for the field. So if we look a little bit deeper into the body is what's going on when we have a traumatic injury. You look at the tissue, and this is a normal capillary bed and what it would look like um, as illustrated by this cartoon. So you have blood vessels with um, a lot of cells going around. There's little exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the capillaries. There's extracellular matrix and white blood cells and red blood cells roaming around in there. Now when the tissue is injured, what happens is it sets off an entire inflammatory cascade. And what that does is through a series of very complicated cell signaling, causes the blood flow in the area to increase. So you get a lot of dilated blood vessels. And the purpose for that is to bring in cells whose job it is to heal the tissue that's been broken. And with that becomes a lot of white blood cells and a lot of what we call cytokines. And cytokines are basically just cell signaling mo molecules that cause fever, they bring healing, they bring swelling, they bring redness, which is all part of the healing process, but subsequently also causes increased pain at the area that's been hurt. So when you look a little bit closer, when there's inflammation in the tissues, this is a, a side profile of a, of a blood vessel here, and there's a little bit of a list of all the cells that come in to help repair those tissues. And it's not so important to know what each one of these does, but it's important to know that they're all coming to the rescue. and by the fact that they're all having to come to the rescue, it's going to increase blood flow, it's going to increase cell signaling, it's going to increase pain, and increase swelling. So that's why when we get any kind of tissue injury and an inflammatory cascade going on, what we see are basically the five cardinal signs of inflammation. We see pain, we feel heat, we see redness, we see swelling, and we see decreased function. And that's all due to the body attempting to heal itself, which I think is pretty incredible. When you look just, I promise this is as deep as we're going to go into the pathophysiology, but it's important to understand where these drugs work. When you're looking at the inflammatory cascade, as that tissue is injured and that cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, starts to send signals down an arachidonic acid pathway that causes inflammation. And if you look at this diagram here, you can see where each of our NSAIDs are acting to stop that cascade. So steroids actually act pretty early in the process, where NSAIDs, I'm sure you've heard on some of the TV commercials, the COX-1 or COX-2 inhibitors, where they're working is right there where you see the, the big X on NSAID. COX means uh, cyclooxygenase enzyme, and what that does is by blocking that enzyme, you're slowing gastric acid secretion, you're decreasing renal blood flow, and you're decreasing platelet ag aggregation at the end of that cascade. So if you take a close look at this diagram, you can understand why NSAIDs cause all the side effects that they do because of what they're inhibiting in the body. Now the benefit that we get from using NSAIDs is that they're stopping that inflammatory cascade. So they're going to decrease the pain, they're going to decrease the swelling, they're going to decrease the redness in the area where we're hurting. But in doing that, they don't just act on the injured tissues, they're acting all over the body. So it causes the side effects on the stomach and the kidneys and the bleeding. So when you look a little bit closer at the GI tract, um, by decreasing the gastric acid secretion and thinning that mucosal lining in the stomach, we're going to get a lot of GI irritation. And this won't be so much with the one dose that we give a patient who's in pain, but if patients are using NSAIDs chronically, that's why they're more prone to getting ulcers. And you can see why that might be a dangerous thing to give NSAIDs to a liver patient who has already has probably esophageal varices and is more prone to GI bleeding anyways. And then the side effects on the kidneys, 
by stopping that inflammatory cascade and decreasing blood flow to areas, one of the most vulnerable areas to decrease blood flow is the kidneys. And when the kidney isn't seeing enough blood flow, it tends to increase blood pressure. And so that's why NSAIDs cause increased blood pressure and which also in return increases sodium absorption and increases water retention. Again, these are problems more chronically. Um, when people are taking NSAIDs over time, it causes more damage. One dose probably isn't, but if people have underlying kidney disease, then it's something to consider because we don't want to cut off blood flow to those kidneys. And another really important side effect to know about with NSAIDs is their effect on platelet aggregation. So if someone is prone to bleeding or we think that they're bleeding, NSAIDs are probably not the best option because you're going to inhibit their coagulation cascade. Again, another example of this would be a liver patient or a renal patient whose platelets aren't working right at baseline, and then you're giving them a drug that's going to make them even less effective. So now, hopefully, our NSAID contraindications make sense. Anyone with a history of bleeding ulcers, liver failure, kidney failure, these are patients that we don't want to be giving NSAIDs to. Another important patient population that shouldn't be getting these drugs is a pregnant patient because it can have adverse fetal effects. So make sure you ask your young female patients if they're pregnant before you give them Tordal or ibuprofen. Moving on to narcotics and how they act, they, uh, you can see from this diagram they act in a lot of different places in the brain, um, most notably reward centers, which is why people tend to get addicted to them. But they do act in pain centers as well, so in the amygdala, the insula, and the anterior cingulate cortex. Another notable place that they act is the brain stem as well, so it can have, as we all know, um, adverse effects on breathing. When I like to consider using fentanyl, the guidelines tell us for severe pain, and that's really the most appropriate place to use it. Anyone who's in obvious acute pain, uh, we use it for chest pain. It can be used in trauma patients. This is probably the most frequent patient population that it gets used in. Anyone who we suspect might be a surgical candidate as well. So um, someone who you think is probably on their way to the operating room, even if it's an abdominal emergency, you want to keep them away from the NSAIDs because of the increased bleeding risk, and it's probably a good idea to keep things out of their stomach as well just to make their operative course a little bit easier. So IV, IM, and intranasal options um, of fentanyl are a good choice here. Don't be afraid to use fentanyl. I, I know that there is a lot of talk these days in the news about uh, opioid crisis and people being addicted to narcotics. But one dose of pain medication for acute, obvious, traumatic pain is not going to create an addict. So please don't be afraid to use it. One of the trickiest cases I encounter in the hospital is patients with abdominal pain. This is a situation where I'd really encourage you to use your clinical judgment and everything in your toolbox in terms of managing a patient's pain. If you think this is an acute surgical abdomen with someone with obviously distended abdomen or you think it's possibly an appendicitis or some terrible process going on based on your assessment of what their abdomen feels like, looking at their vital signs, looking at how they're presenting to you, if they're diaphoretic, if they're tachycardic, if they're hunched over and crying in pain, then absolutely treat that patient um, with narcotics if you think that's indicated. But very frequently, we get patients with chronic abdominal pain and this might be your patient with a 12 out of 10 pain who's sitting there on the stretcher and texting and looking totally normal. In that case, you can consider some of your other options. I would still be wary of using NSAIDs in this patient because we do know that NSAIDs can cause GI upset and GI ulcers, and we might not necessarily be able to see those on our clinical exam. So this might be a patient where I'd consider using Tylenol. That way you're still addressing their pain but you aren't necessarily giving them any narcotics and feeding into any secondary gain. And you're considering um, that it might be an ulcer and holding back on the NSAIDs. There is an interesting entity in our society that's becoming more and more common, at least from what I see in the emergency department anecdotally. There's a, a disease called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And as um, cannabis becomes more and more popular in our society, more and more people are seeing these side effects. I think it tends to build up in the system over time, and there's an unfortunate small percentage of the population where 
Over time, their frequent cannabis use leads them to chronic abdominal pain and persistent vomiting. Now, sometimes these patients can be pretty sick. Um, they come in with pretty large electrolyte abnormalities. They can be tachycardic. They can be fairly dehydrated. One of the clinical clues that I use to diagnose this syndrome is actually I ask them what makes it better. And very frequently, they will say the only thing that makes it better is a hot shower. And once they tell me that, I'll ask about their um, cannabis use. And not, not infrequently, it'll be pretty frequently that they're using it. And um, this can be a challenging thing to talk to the patient about because frequently they don't want to hear that it's the cannabis is causing their problems. They'll say that it actually makes it better. It's just something to kind of file away and know about. This is a patient that I would likely treat either with Tylenol or NSAIDs and probably not narcotics. One interesting note about nausea, this is my favorite article from the literature over the last couple of years. It's the use of isopropyl alcohol pads to treat nausea. It was a very nicely done randomized control trial and actually anesthesiologists have been doing it for a really long time after surgery. Um, you can basically, if a patient has intractable nausea, instead of having to give them Zofran and start an IV, you can just give them literally an alcohol pad to keep sniffing until their nausea goes away. And I've been doing my own little trials in the emergency department, and it's actually very effective. So when do we use NSAIDs? I like to use NSAIDs for just about everything. Most people's pain falls into the mild or moderate category. And as we looked at that um, diagram earlier of all the places that it acts and all the side effects that it um, of the inflammatory cascade that it stops. I think it's very effective at treating pain. It's really good for musculoskeletal pain. It's really good for a fever with body aches and a person who has flu-like symptoms. And it's incredibly effective in young people. So don't be afraid to use Motrin. It works on pain, it's effective, and in general it's pretty safe as long as you know um, which population to use it in. And an important population that we need to think about when we're talking about pain is pediatrics. So I'd encourage us to treat pediatric pain. Um, our options, we can, if it's severe pediatric pain, don't be afraid to use your narcotics. And intranasal, again, is always a good option for pediatrics because needles are just going to inflict more, more uh, trauma for them, usually. But um, Motrin and Tylenol are also an option at least at the paramedic level. So for Tylenol, our dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram, and for Motrin, it's going to be 10 milligrams per kilogram. Now, when do I use Tylenol? This is kind of my last tool in my bag of tricks. I tend to use it more in the elderly because they do have so many comorbidities, and I use it for patients that can't take NSAIDs because I do think NSAIDs are way more effective at treating pain. And then if I have someone who just has a fever, I'll use Tylenol there as well. Now, one important thing I want you guys to take away from this talk is just be careful when you're giving any medications. Um, medical errors cost billions of dollars every year in the medical industry, and it's not just in the pre-hospital setting, it's in the hospital setting as well. So anyone who is out there giving medications, just think twice before you give it. I think a very important thing to note here is that some of the drugs that we give are actually lethal weapons. People are dying every day from narcotic overdoses in this country, and we know that fentanyl can be a dangerous drug. Um, same with Versed. They each have side effects that we need to know and be aware of and continue to monitor for after we give the medication. Now, I'm not saying don't give it. I'm just saying give it responsibly and then be able to monitor the patient after you do. One very important point with any medication, I think, is to start low and go slow. You can always give more medication if you need it, but you can't take it back once it's in. So just keep a close eye on that patient, continually reassess, and I tend to give the lower dose on the end of the spectrum just to be safe, especially in pediatric and elderly patients. And remember when we're giving narcotics or Versed just to monitor the capnography every time. One thing that we can do to ensure patient safety is cross checks. And this isn't a sign of weakness, and it's not just related to emergency medicine. It's actually done frequently in high stakes situations in any industry. So, airline pilots use it. I know it's used in the military a lot. We'll do it in the operating room. 
and then frequently in the emergency department before we intubate somebody. So anytime there's high stakes situations with patient safety on the line, it's important to do these cross checks. Every time we need to be checking to make sure we have the right patient, the right medication, the right route, the right dose, and the right indication for the medication. It isn't a sign of weakness to do these medication checks. No one's immune to making errors. I do it every time I give a medication in the hospital, and I know the nurses do too, and it's an expectation from the field. Don't be afraid to look up your doses either. We're all working in an environment where we're tired, and sometimes it's difficult to think, and we're in high-stress situations, so that's why we have apps and references to double-check our doses before we actually administer the medication. Like I mentioned, we're all tired, it's important to be extra cautious when you know that you're at higher risk. So if your workflow is disorganized, if you're on a chaotic scene, if you're under a ton of stress or you're being disrupted or distracted or you're tired, please take that extra second to just double check what you're doing because it's going to save patients. Really, all of those things are happening on every single scene, so it's important to be vigilant. And this doesn't just account for ALS providers, this is for BLS medications as well. Tylenol overdoses are actually one of the leading cause of liver transplants in this country. But that said, mistakes do happen. So if you realize that you gave a medication to a patient and it was in error, it's okay. Just keep taking care of that patient. Recognize that you did it. Reverse what you can and then be sure to monitor their vital signs and continually reassess what's happening. Make sure you tell that medication error to the hospital staff at turnover, and uh, then let your 7-8 know. Mistakes, again, mistakes do happen. It's important to be honest. Just make sure you're letting the right people know, and most importantly, you're taking good care of that patient. So looking at some cases, case number one would be a five-year-old female that fell off a trampoline. She's got an obvious femur deformity. I would use fentanyl here for her pain. You can use intranasal, it would be a very effective option. This is obviously gonna be severe pain and you wanna treat it quickly. Case number two, 80 year old female who slipped and fell in the bathroom with right hip pain, obvious fracture, she can't ambulate. Again, severe pain, we're gonna use fentanyl here. You can use intranasal IM or if you have time, get an IV going. Case number three, a 30-year-old female with chronic abdominal pain with nausea, same pain for months, normal vital signs, 10 out of 10, appears comfortable. This is the patient we were talking about early. Could be likely cannabis hyperemesis, could be something else. We have other pain options here besides narcotics. One good option would be Tylenol. Another might be ketamine. Case number four would be a 20-year-old male with fever, sore throat, body aches for three days, kind of flu-like symptoms, thinks he might have strep throat. I really like Motrin for these complaints because those are all inflammatory symptoms, not necessarily severe acute pain, and Motrin is going to be more effective on that uh, inflammatory cascade. Another option that we do have is Tordal, so if you want to do an IM shot or IV, that will be very effective as well. Last case is a 50-year-old male with his hand stuck in an industrial machine. He's awake and talking in obvious pain. You're thinking it's going to take forever to get his hand extricated. This is a case where after you consider controlling bleeding, maybe placing a tourniquet and his uh, controlling his ABCs. When you're moving on to controlling his pain, I would do fentanyl here or ketamine with a plan to continually managing, managing his pain effectively until his extrication is completed.